Sometimes the episode's dropping on Mondays. It's the man, it's the man, watch that. 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 And welcome to the Matt Watch That Podcast, the place for reviews, rants, and randomness. I'm your host, Matt Sarosky, filmmaker, film fan. Each episode, I'm going to watch a movie or TV pilot that I probably should have seen but never got around to. It could be a recent favorite, critic's choice, or cult classic. Everyone can join in on the fun. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've discussed or suggestions as to what I should see next, use the hashtag MattWatchThat on social. Before we start, when Olivia Newton-John passed away, I got a little nostalgic, sentimental, and I re-watched a couple of videos, interviews, concerts. I think everyone knows her from Greece, but she had a colossal bomb called Xanadu, which, believe it or not, was turned into a Broadway musical. It's not a great movie. I mean, outside of Whip It, there aren't too many roller skating themed films that actually work. Nevertheless, it's got a really good soundtrack. The title song Xanadu featured the Electric Light Orchestra. Now, I could swear to you that I've never heard a single song by ELO. I knew absolutely nothing about them. Are they even a them? Is it like a Trent Reznor Nine Inch Nails thing? So I'm inquisitive. I had to find out about ELO. Turns out, there was a name that was very familiar to me. Jeff Lynn. You see, when there were vinyl records and CDs, I would look through the liner notes and become familiar with producers, engineers, mixers, studio musicians. So I know him through his association with Tom Petty another artist lost too soon. Together, they co-wrote Free Fallen, I Won't Back Down, Learning to Fly, and Into the Great Wide Open. He would team up with Tom Petty alongside other notable artists, Roy Orbison, George Harrison, and Bob Dylan, to form the supergroup, The Traveling Wilburys. They took pseudonyms, shared the writing credits and the lead vocals. They would release two albums featuring the hits Handle with Care, End of the Line, She's My Baby, and Inside Out. Jeff Lynne would produce solo albums for Roy Orbison and Tom Petty, as well as Brian Adams and Paul McCartney. He worked with McCartney and bandmates George Harrison and Ringo Starr on Free as a Bird, the first new recording released 25 years after their breakup, for the Beatle anthology. It went to number 6 on the Billboard Hot 100 and earned a Grammy Award. In 2017, Jeff Lynne was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as part of Electric Light Orchestra. Turns out, I know a couple of ELO songs. Don't Bring Me Down, which has been featured in numerous movies and trailers, you'd be able to name that tune in three notes. Evil Woman isn't instantly recognizable until you get to the chorus and go, yeah, that rings a bell. They definitely have a signature sound, and that sound is the 70s. I don't think their music ages as well, but I won't be too quick to turn it off. So what band have you heard of, but don't think you know any songs by them? Hit me up on social media using the hashtag MattWatchThat. On to the main attraction. Each review will end with a ranking out of five stars. One star is Skip It, two stars Watch at Your Own Risk, three stars Standard Fare, four stars Worth Checking Out, and five stars Must See. Now, if I give a title five stars, it doesn't mean I'm comparing it to Casablanca, Jaws, or Seinfeld. I rank titles based on other movies or TV series in that genre and at that time period. So let's jump into it. These are my ruminations and observations of the movie Murder by Death from 1976. It was directed by Robert Moore, who helmed The Cheap Detective, Chapter 2, and episodes of Rhoda. He was best known for his work in the theater, directing Promises, Promises, Lorelei, Death Trap, and Woman of the Year. The screenplay was written by the great Neil Simon, who scribed The Odd Couple, Barefoot in the Park, Brighton Beach Memoirs, The Goodbye Girl, and plenty more. This is something to look out for. The animated scenes which bookends the movie was drawn by Charles Adams, creator of the popular New Yorker cartoon, The Adams Family, which would turn into a television series and movie franchise. The movie stars Peter Sellers as Inspector Sidney Wang. I'll talk about the appropriateness of that casting choice later. 
He started his career in the theater and sporadic appearances on television, but made his name on The Goon Show, co-starring with Spike Milligan and Harry Seacombe, which was broadcast on BBC Home Service Radio. His first major film role was in The Lady Killers, alongside Sir Alec Guinness. He would go on to big screen success in the Pink Panther franchise, Dr. Strangelove, What's New Pussycat, and another parody, Casino Royale. David Niven and Maggie Smith portray Mr. and Mrs. Dick and Dora Charleston. He won an Academy Award for Best Actor in a Leading Role for Separate Tables. She has two Academy Awards to her name for Best Actress in a Leading Role for The Prime of Miss Jean Brody and Best Actress in a Supporting Role for California Suite. They would star together in the 1978 film Death on the Nile and Better Late Than Never in 1983. James Coco plays Monsieur Milo Perrier. He trained at HB Studio in New York and made his Broadway debut in Hotel Paradiso and would bounce between roles in the theater and bit parts on television. I recognized him from The Muppets Take Manhattan, where he brought Snookums to board at Rolf's Kennel. He won a Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Drama Series for St. Elsewhere and was nominated for a Best Actor in a Supporting Role Oscar for Only When I Laugh. Elsa Lanchester acts as Miss Jessica Marbles. She was born in London to Bohemian parents. She studied dance in Paris and upon returning to the UK, she started a children's theater and a cabaret nightclub where she performed. She made her film debut in The Scarlet Woman in 1925, but is most recognizable for playing the title role in The Bride of Frankenstein. She was nominated for two Best Actresses in a Supporting Role Oscars for Witness for the Prosecution and Come to the Stable. Peter Falk performs as Mr. Sam Diamond. If you'd like a full retrospective of his career, it's available in episode 29, where I review Columbo legendary actor who's been nominated for 12 Primetime Emmy Awards, winning five, and also nominated for two Oscars. His most beloved role and my personal favorite is the grandfather in The Princess Bride. On a dark and stormy night, millionaire Lionel Twain summons a group of celebrated detectives to his mansion for dinner and a murder. He asks his blind butler, Jameser Bensimum, to stamp and mail out the invitations. The attendees include Inspector Sidney Wang, who is accompanied by his adopted son Willie, socialites Mr. and Mrs. Dick and Dora Charleston, along with their terrier Myron, Belgian gumshoe Monsieur Milo Perrier, who arrives with his chauffeur Marcel Cassette, portrayed by James Cromwell in his feature film debut, Mr. Sam Diamond, a hard-boiled detective from San Francisco, assisted by his secretary, Tess Skeffington, played by Eileen Brennan, who a decade later would star in another comedy mystery, Clue, as Mrs. Peacock, and British sleuth, Miss Jessica Marbles, who brings her nurse, Miss Withers. When the guests arrive, they're all called to dinner at nine o'clock and introductions are made, though they all have crossed paths at some point in their travels. Dick Charleston makes a toast to the unseen host as he's succeeded in gathering the world's greatest detectives to investigate a crime that hasn't been committed yet. There were traps set for them, a bridge that almost collapses, statues falling from overhead, but these obstacles were not meant to kill them, only to whet their appetite for the game. And he chose all of them, not just one, because he intends to take on each of them. With a flash of light, the host, Lionel Twain, makes an appearance. He's portrayed by novelist and playwright Truman Capote, writer of Breakfast at Tiffany's, In Cold Blood, and Answered Prayers. Twain compliments the guests, as none of them have ever had an unsolved murder, but claims that he's the world's greatest criminologist. He wondered what would happen if the greatest living detectives found themselves trapped in a country house for the weekend and discover a dead body on the floor, stabbed 12 times in the back with a butcher's knife, and not one of them were able to figure out the culprit. Twain declares that at the stroke of midnight, someone in the house is going to be viciously murdered, and he'll give $1 million to the person who solves the crime. Here's a quote without context. No, no, it's all right. My wine's not poisoned. It was just a bad year. Murder by Death is a funny movie. It took a little while to find its footing, but once all the guests arrive, it's easy, breezy, and enjoyable. The biggest faux pas is Peter Sellers as Sidney Wang, even though it's a parody of Charlie Chan, who was also played by a Caucasian actor, it's still somewhat uncomfortable to watch stereotypes of a culture, especially when exaggerated, even if tongue is firmly planted in cheek. 
I mean, on the bad taste scale, it's definitely up there with Long Duck Dong from Sixteen Candles and Mickey Rooney's portrayal of Mr. Yunioshi in Breakfast at Tiffany's. On the positive, Peter Falk as the tough-as-nails detective was a highlight. Even though he's traveled similar ground, the role of Sam Diamond has much more of an edge than Columbo. Now, as I was watching the film, I was waiting for the appearance of Alec Guinness. I saw his name in the credits, but I kept asking myself, where's Obi-Wan? Turns out, he was right in front of me the whole time. He played James Sir Benson Mum, almost unrecognizable to me. He was bald, no facial hair, no lightsaber, but he was very good as the butler. Impeccable timing. Murder by Death reminds me a bit of Knives Out, which has ushered in other whodunit movies like the Death on the Nile remake, Murder Mystery, and See How They Run. I'm definitely looking forward to the sequel, Glass Onion. Now for a little trivial trivia. While working on this film, Alec Guinness received the script for Star Wars. It was produced by Ray Stark, who is in charge of Annie, Brighton Beach Memoirs, Biloxi Blues, Steel Magnolias, and was nominated as part of Best Picture for Funny Girl in 1968 and The Goodbye Girl in 1977. The cinematography was captured by David M. Walsh, whose filmography includes Sleeper, The Goodbye Girl, What About Bob, and Summer School. It was edited by John F. Burnett, who worked on The Way We Were, The Sunshine Boys, Grease, and Class Act. The score was composed by Dave Grusin, who worked on the music for Heaven Can Wait, On Golden Pond, Tootsie, The Goonies, The Fabulous Baker Boys, and won an Oscar for Best Music Original Score for the Milagro Beanfield War. I thought it was really spot on. It felt like it could fit right in there with PBS Masterpiece Mystery. The runtime is 1 hour 34 minutes. No budget information, but it did gross $32 million at the box office. An indirect sequel, The Cheap Detective, was released in 1978, featuring many of the same cast and crew. I give it 3.5 out of 5 stars. Add half a star if you're a fan of Clue. This should be right up your alley. Take off a star if stereotypes and caricatures make you cringe. If you've seen Murder by Death and have opinions on the movie, let me know what you think using the hashtag MattWatchThat. Moving right along, each episode, I'm going to post clips that I think people should watch. It could be movie trailers, music videos, interviews, or something completely random. Search for my YouTube page and there will be a playlist called Matt Watch That Playback. Over 70 years since it debuted on television, I Love Lucy continues to be watched by millions of people worldwide. A cross-generational show that can be enjoyed by children all the way to grandparents. It was one of the first live-action sitcoms that I consistently watched, and it was always on in reruns. I think what makes it most relatable is its silliness. There is a very childlike quality to it, and as you get older, you're told to grow up, and you're forced to temper that goofiness. But then you see an adult, like Lucille Ball as Lucy Ricardo, doing pratfalls, slapstick, pantomime, and you realize that you don't have to lose that playfulness as an adult. But I think what gets lost is how groundbreaking I Love Lucy was as a series, and how influential Lucy and Desi were as business partners. They produced the show on film, which was a rarity at that time due to expense, but has paid off in the long run because the quality of the series has never diminished. It's always looked great. While most sitcoms of the time were shot with one camera and canned laughter, Lucy wanted to work in front of an audience similar to the theater. To capture the live environment, they used a three-camera setup which was pioneered by Jerry Fairbanks, but they perfected it for a sitcom, where it's become the standard for most shows filmed in front of a studio audience. When Lucille Ball became pregnant, or as they said on the show, expecting, they were unable to film as many episodes that season, so Desi Arnaz and producer Jess Oppenheimer told the network to repeat popular episodes from the first season. The repeat airings were a rating success, and that led to the invention of the rerun, which in turn has led to many lucrative syndication deals. Under their Desilu Productions banner, they greenlit Mannix, The Untouchables, Mission Impossible, and the groundbreaking Star Trek. For their contributions to the entertainment industry, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz have two stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame for television and motion pictures. I've selected a couple of videos for your enjoyment. The first was produced by the Desilu Playhouse, which features a behind-the-scene look at I Love Lucy. 
The second is an 8mm color video that was filmed by an audience member at I Love Lucy. This isn't colorized like CBS has been doing recently with a couple of episodes. This is actual footage where you see Lucy, Desi, and the sets in living color. The last are some bloopers from season 4. Not traditional bloopers. You're not seeing anyone break character, but some line flubs that stayed in the show, continuity errors, or things you might not have noticed. They're all available in the Matt Watch That Playback playlist on YouTube. Check it out. Now it's time for the recommendation. Yes, that's the word recommendation with Matt in the middle. I'm going to end each podcast with my own recommendation of a movie or TV series. Today I'm talking about... Weird, the Al Yankovic story. It was co-written by Weird Al Yankovic and Eric Appel, who made his feature directorial debut with this movie, based on a Funny or Die trailer released as a spoof in 2010. It stars Daniel Radcliffe, who plays a warped version of the titular character. I'm not sure how he's been able to have a successful career, especially as a child star who's so closely associated with Harry Potter, but he's made the transition to adulthood just fine and managed to find roles that complement his talents. He did learn how to play the accordion in preparation for the role, but to be honest, outside of Al Yankovic, Frankie Yankovic, and the late Judy Tenuta, who could tell the difference? But his singing is dubbed. Evan Rachel Wood plays Madonna and has the voice down pat. If you close your eyes, you wouldn't know that it wasn't the material girl. She's done impressions of Madonna, Alanis Morissette, and Janis Joplin on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, so check that out if you have a chance. It also stars Rain Wilson and has appearances by Lin-Manuel Miranda, Thomas Lennon, Patton Oswalt, Michael McKean, Conan O'Brien, Paul F. Tompkins, Jack Black, Josh Groban, and Seth Green. It's a silly movie, fun and entertaining, parodies all the pitfalls of VH1's behind the music and music biopics. That's what you expect when Weird Al is involved. It does go off the rails a little bit at the end, but by that time, you're already invested. They did a great job with the song usage. As I mentioned, the singing is dubbed, but they didn't just take the original versions and use those vocals. Weird Al actually recorded new versions of those songs, so it gives it a bit of a fresh take. It still looks odd hearing Weird Al's voice coming out of Daniel Radcliffe's face, but that was also kind of the point. Fun fact, Lisa Popel, the daughter of pocket fisherman inventor S.J. Popel, and half-sister to But Wait, There's More, Ron Popel, sings background vocals on the soundtrack. Now if you know that reference, you know. The score was composed by Leo Berenberg and Zach Robinson, who are known for their work on Cobra Kai. Weird, the Al Yankovic story, is available for free, streaming on the Roku channel. That's all for this edition of Matt Watch That. Thanks for listening to me babble. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've discussed or suggestions as to what movie or TV pilot I should see, use the hashtag MattWatchThat on social. Head over to mattsaroski.com for the latest news and updates, and come back next time for the reviews, rants, and randomness.